Please help me welcome Harold to me. I've got to work on a shorter bio. I'm over there squirming for four minutes. So, so my bad, I should learn from that. So um, as you know, I, I have two passions. Um, one is software security, that's my day job. And to keep the pounds off, my other passion is running. And I've taken up um, running in the last four or five years. And I see a lot of parallels between what I do in getting engineers to develop secure software and what I do in the running community, um, just having fun doing races and exploring um, my limits in the countryside. So I thought I'd merge these two together. And, you know, if you ever watch a good TV show like NCIS or anything else, you'll notice that they have at least two, maybe three plots going on at any given time. So you're over here with one group solving this and over here with another, and they kind of bounce back and forth to keep you, keep you occupied. So I thought, okay, let's see if I can do that in a presentation. And so what I wanted to do is compare these two loves that I have. Um, and I'll, get, I'll skip all this because she went over that already. And so the, I'm going to call these two different plots. Plot number one will be developing secure software. That's engineers actually building software that is bug free or vulnerability free as much as possible. And the second plot will be what I call running um, an, an ultra marathon. It could be an ultra is anything farther than a marathon. Um, usually starts at 50K, which is 31 miles, um, but they go, they go much farther than that. So my question to you is, which do you think is easier to do? To develop secure software or to say run a 100 mile ultra marathon? Okay, anyone venture to guess? Number one? Number two. Number two. Okay, got two twos and one one. Any, any other takers? Number two. Okay. Over here, neither? Neither. Okay, well, you know, I was a product manager when, when for 10, 12 years, so when, when people would tell me that both features are just important, I'd say, why, thank you. That means I can prioritize them. I'd go, no, they're both important. I go, you don't understand. I have to force rank them. So this one's now important, more important than this one. And it would always bug them. But, so if, if they're neither, then I can choose for you, right? So, <laughs> it's just something we do. Okay, so I'm try hopefully I don't confuse you. So on each of my slides, I'll put a number one if it's the technical, and number two if, if it's the running. So I thought I'd start out with what the scenario really is. Um, over at Intel Security, as we mentioned formerly McAfee, we have just over 110 enterprise and consumer security products. And we have more if you count the legacy ones that we're still supporting. Um, we have several thousand software engineers in QA that are out there coding and getting these products to the market. Um, when you include the antivirus and whatnot, we have many millions of customers. And so what happens when somebody comes along and says, Intel? We use product XYZ, and we found a vulnerability. And we'll sh we can even show you. Here's what it does. It, it exposes information, or it lets people take over my machine, which is one of the worst things. So the question is, now what do we do? And how did this even happen? And the question is, you got the ultimate irony is a company like where I work, you're buying software to protect you from the bad guys. And if our software accidentally introduces a vulnerability, we actually are enabling the bad guys to get into your system because of us. Okay, that's ultimate irony. And that's also the worst case scenario. So we take things very seriously. Um, so much so that we have some very strict SLAs internally based on how severe things are to how fast we get things patched. Um, I've seen things patched in less than four hours. Um, and so, um, if you talk to the other side of Intel where they do hot chips, they said, they tell me, so you guys are so lucky. When we have a, a chip level vulnerability, it takes us nine months. Maybe six months if we break the bank and really get it out. So we, we're talking a day, they're talking quarters. Um, so, so it's a little bit different. So that's the scenario. 
And then if I were to jump to the other side, the running side, and you'll see in these running slides, the scenarios I'm coming up actually mirror my journey over the last four years. So one day you look down and you realize you've gained about 50 pounds in the past 10 years. Okay, I don't, whether they creeped up on you or not, they're there. Um, you hear running is healthy and it's easy. You don't have to buy a bike or anything. You just start running. And so you set a goal to run an ultra marathon. Now obviously you're not gonna go from zero to 100 in 10 seconds, um, unless you're suicidal. Um, but yes, you're crazy. And the question is, how do I pull this off? No different than if you say, I have software and it needs to be secured. How do I pull this off? Where do I start? So those are the two scenarios. So let's start with the team. Going back to the software side, the most important thing you can have for developing secure software is executive level support. If you don't have a support on top, then you're just you're left to be a lot of you, the engineers are going to do their best, but they're just not going to, it's not going to be a high priority. In fact, I've seen product managers tell me in my face, I don't have to worry about security. I kind of get that for free. The engineers do it anyways. And I look at them and said, you, you realize, you can't, you can't say that to me. I used to have your job for 10 years. Everything's prioritized. Quality is a feature. If you don't give it time for quality then and resources into it, you have a buggy software. Security. Privacy, those are all features. They take energy. You gotta prioritize them in or you don't get them. And so we, we hold their, their feet to the fire on that. So um, once you have executive support, you then need, of course, the software engineers that are executing, doing the code. And in our case, we have a product security group. Um, not even that big. There's about um, four of us right now for the, the large company. And the way we get away with having such a small group is we leverage product security architects that are co-located throughout the world at the different engineering teams. So put simply, the executives have given us permission to go to the, each of those product teams and say, loan us one of your security architects. We would like to tax them no more than 20% of their time, and they will be the ones responsible for security in that product. They'll lead the security reviews, they'll lead the, th lead the threat modeling, if there's an incident, they'll be the ones saying, let's get a patch. I even make them write to security bulletins because that's a pain and I want them to feel that pain. Um, and so they do all that work and it starts from the top. And then of course you have others like tech support, um, tier three support, they, they make sure everything's accurate. You have the KB team, knowledge base team, they're the ones who publish the bulletins. Um, and they're always an extended team, um, especially you know, we work with PR and every week we meet with PR and say, okay, this one might hit the fan, get a statement ready. And nine times out of 10, we then they never use the statement and we have it fixed so fast it doesn't matter. But you always have to be ready. Um, if not, then my job's short lived and I don't want that. Okay, going to the running side. Also looking at the crew, um, the most important thing you need, assuming you're married, is a supportive spouse. Because running takes a lot of time. Um, you also may consider getting a trainer, depending on how serious you are. Um, you should always have some running buddies. And I mentioned in my case, I asked my wife, do you want to go running with me? She goes, no, I got bad knees. So I went to my son, and do you want to go running? And he ran a half marathon with me once, and he goes, ah, not for me. I went to my daughter, he goes, no, I'll walk a 5K every now and then, that's about it. So I went to my dog, and my dog said, yeah, 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 let's go. So, you know, I started at the top, worked my way down. And I actually... I took our little dog, Roxy, got her at um, third Monday trade days, and um, I started walking with her when she was about a year old, because I couldn't run, I was too heavy. And after walking for a while and working on that, then we started jogging, then running. And as we mentioned, this she's wearing the Phoenix, Phoenix Marathon medal that we just ran two months ago. She's finished 35 marathons with me. Um, eight of those are ultras. And so, and she gets her runner's high. She's just totally happy. Um, she's well known around the community. She doesn't bite. She's really friendly. So a really good running companion, really good crew. She's wearing a Marathon Maniacs jersey because um, she's a level six crazy because that's what we do. Um, and then again, you can't really pull this goal off unless you have some good race volunteers and maybe even a pacer, someone to help you out when you're, when you're struggling. So going back to the product security, 
no matter what your best efforts are, doesn't matter how good you are, there's always going to be something that slips through the cracks. There's always going to be a vulnerability. It might be a low severity, but usually medium or high. You're going to have something that happens, and you're going to have to respond to it. Uh, the, the cost of, of testing every single path of your software every single time is too cost and time prohibitive. So you do your best. So whenever we get an incident come in, my team, my PCERT team, which stands for Product Security Incident Response Team, the first thing we do is we contact the network of product security champions. Um, then we verify the vulnerability. It, sometimes these are just like, oh yeah, we fixed that. You have an old version. We fixed that a year ago. Or you know, you know, or you know, you, that's that doesn't count. You're already logged in as admin, and you said you got admin access. You're already admin, so you get things like that. So we verify them. And then we give them a score, um, something called CVSS, Common Vulnerability Scoring System. And based on that score, we will get a lower, medium, or high, and that determines how fast we respond. Um, we always communicate to the discoverer, the person who told us the vulnerability. Um, the sooner, the better. Um, there's even a website I saw that will keep score as to how fast a vendor will respond to a vulnerability report. Um, we responded in, in an hour. Um, their record is 10 minutes, <laughs> which is like people keeping score how fast vendors say, oh yeah, we got it. It's kind of funny. So then we develop a patch, we publish security bulletin, and then when the next one comes along, we, we're there for the process. So I mentioned this process because this is what you do um, when things don't work out well. It's a safety net. And it's not that much different than if you're going to do a, a, a trail run or any type of running, there's a process you're going to follow. Um, the most important is you've got to turn off the TV and get out and start running. Okay? And if you set a goal to do it, it's even better. Um, I'd rather sit down and watch a TV show and eat a bowl of ice cream myself. But if I do that a lot, um, I, I pay for it. So it's pretty easy. So you want to, um, one of my things that I did, is I would sign up for the, lo the most local weekend race. Look for a half marathon or something. Um, and just see if I could just, you know, stay in enough shape to run those. But again, set goals, find people that are like-minded um, runners. Um, when I say learn by experience, that's just really another way of saying learn by pain. Pain will teach you a lot of things. When you get a sunburn after a run on a beach, on one side of your face, because you're running on one side of the beach, you realize, oh, I should use sunscreen, at least on that side of the face. Okay, so pain, pain teaches you lots of things. And of course, build up to it. Now, and just real quickly, just some possible training goals. Just look at how I did it. I ran a 5K um, several years ago, and I thought I was in reasonably good shape. In fact, I ran the first part so fast I passed everybody. <laughs> and then I was out of breath, and then I could hardly finish the darn thing. It took me 40 minutes to finish a 5K. And I thought, oh crud, this is not good. I really got to get in shape. So I set a goal to run a half marathon um, about six months later. And I picked the downhill one, so I knew I could do it. And I pulled that one off. And then I picked the full marathon uh, a year's time from that. Um, did that here in Allen, um, the New Year's Eve double. And so I wasn't, I wasn't one, of the, one of the last ones to come in. I beat the timer by 20 minutes, but I finished it. That's what mattered. The next year, I decided to set a goal to run a half marathon or farther every weekend. Um, and at first, it was hard. And then, like anything else, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Um, last year, my goal was to run an ultra marathon at least once a month. Okay, so it was hard, but at least I did it. It was something you could do. And I thought I'd try a triathlon because, you know, there's got to be more than just running. You know, there's bikes and swimming. Let's try that out. So I tried some of those out. I tried the, they have what's called an Ironman, which is the full marathon, three miles or so of swimming and 140 miles of bike riding. Just crazy. Okay. And this triathlons came about in Hawaii when runners and bicyclists and swimmers were saying, no, we're better. No, we're better. Well, some guy says, let's just put them all together and see who's really better. Okay. And so... So I, I, I signed up for a half triathlon I'm doing tomorrow. It hits, hits Marble Falls. Okay, that I'm, I'm reaching, I'm looking for stretch goals. I'm not saying this is easy for me, but I want to see where that goes. 
Um, and my goal this year is to see if I can run a 100 miler every month starting in June. Okay, so I have to take this stuff seriously and try to have fun with it. And I, I, met, I list these out because these years and these things we're doing are not that much different than what you would do in, a, um, in software development. And I'll get to that in just a moment. One of the things we see a lot in the engineering world is starting last April, people started giving cute names to big vulnerabilities. Um, we had Heartbleed. That was the first, I mean, we had Code Red 10 years ago. I never saw a cute logo for Code Red. Um, but we have Heartbleed. It was an open SSL vulnerability. It affected 19 of the McAfee products. And the SB is a security bolt, and this is all public information. You can go look it up and see everything about it. Um, then we had Heartbleed 2, then Shellshock, then Poodle, then Ghost, then Freak. And just last month, we had 14 open SSL vulnerabilities. They didn't give it a cute name, but it was still bad. And you could see how many different products that we had to patch um, at, at our company. And I call this the gift that keeps on giving, OpenSSL that is, because they announced, OpenSSL announced that they're going to be doing an internal audit. They're paying an external company to do an internal audit of OpenSSL and they expect to release their findings in early in the summer. And like any other person, if you don't produce results, then they go, what the heck did you do during that audit? So I'm expecting more, uh, more heart bleed <laughs> to come my way. In fact, I'm at a point now whenever I see a bunch, uh, I see another open SSL vulnerability that's a medium or, or higher, rather than waiting a day or two for the engineers to come back and say it's vulnerable, I'd say just start the security bulletin. Let's just get it going. I already know where this is going. Okay, the pain's there. Um, so when I mentioned the word named vulnerabilities, there are, there are some very popular named races, some local, some not. Last Monday, just a few days ago, we had the Boston Marathon. And so that one's, that one's the one that everyone wants to get in. You have to run really, really fast or raise a lot of money for a charity to get into that. Um, and I, I would like to do it sometime, but I haven't qualified yet. The hardest one is called Badwater. Uh, it's a 135 mile run where you, you start in Death Valley in California and you hike all the way to um, the, near the top of Mount Whitney. And it's 135, yeah, you've got to start below sea level, at the, the lowest sea level to the highest sea level in, in one state. It's not supposed to be easy, not everyone makes it, but when they do make it, you know, they wear their shirt proudly and they brag about it. You know, that's fun. I, I'm not one of those guys. Um, I don't even plan on doing bad water, it just sounds painful. Um, locally, um, there's a 100-mile run. Again, if you have a goal, you've got to know where you're going to do it. There's a big cedar 100-miler just in, um, in the southern part of Dallas in the big cedar wilderness area. That's in the week of Halloween. There's Brazos Bend in December, just down in southern Texas. And then another local favorite is the Rocky Raccoon over in Huntsville. So I just list these. That these are in our own backyard, things that, that people do. Um, around you. Um, so, going back to software security. When I was in an IT role, I thought software security was basically about what I call doing some of the basics and that was it. Okay, I've since learned there's a lot more to it than that. But you do have to start with the basics. And the basics are you have some, an SDL stands for Secure Development Life Cycle. It's like an engineering development life cycle, but it has to do with where security gets implemented. So there's some minimum activities which I'll touch on. Um, if you talk to Microsoft, they'll say, please, we have some flags you can set when you compile that'll check for buffer overflows. It'll check for null pointers. It'll check for all these things. Use them, okay? You can, you can use the one that sets them all, or you can use subsets where you can, there's one that says this one gives me all 50 of them, or you can start with one at a time, because no one wants to drink from a, a fire hose. But get those, put those in there, and you know, do the stack checking, do that stuff, it's free, it's right there. Um, there are some what's called band C functions, the old printfs, they don't do buffer overflow checking. So they're, they're the favorites for buffer overflows. 
And so those, those have been banned by Microsoft and most everyone else. Um, fix the medium and high severity vulnerabilities before the product ships. Um, do static, dynamic, and fuzz testing. If you don't know what those are, static analysis is, is something where you look for bugs during compile time. It actually compiles the code alongside with the real compile, and it's looking for the low-hanging fruit. It's looking for the, like I say, the null pointers, rough overflows, those kind of things, and says, okay, here's where I found it, and it lines right into your source code. Right here, I found a problem, I'll fix it. So it's, it's, it's something that anyone can use. Dynamic analysis is when the program is already running, it's been compiled and it's running, and now you're throwing things at it, testing it that way. And then fuzz testing, which I never heard of until a few years ago, it came, it came by a professor who basically said, you know, if I take, let's say, a, a, a software product is uh, expecting a certain packet, a TCP or UDP packet, and if I send that data and I change a bit here or make the data too long there and send it to that program, how does it react? Well, most of the time it just says, you're garbage, it throws it out. But what happens if you start twiddling these, bit twiddling these intelligently and sending a million an hour? Okay, well, there's tools that do that. And after a week of fuzz testing, it's, it's easy to have a list of maybe seven scenarios that'll crash your program. Yes, sir? That is correct. I believe it was Wisconsin. And now there, if you're into the products, there's two products that are, there's probably a lot more. There's actually dozens. But the two I look at, there's one called Peach Fuzzing Platform. It's a freebie. Um, and it's powerful, but you have to, it takes a lot to learn it. I've gone through a two-day course on it, and it tells you how to tweak all the address fields and data fields and everything to, to really be clever. Um, and then there's another one called Code and Omicron. And in fact, they were just bought by Synopsys um, last week. I was at RSA a couple days ago, and that was a big announcement. Um, and there's a whole lot more than that. But those are just a couple that we use um, for fuzz testing. And I can tell you, if we don't do our own fuzz testing, a bank will hire some security consultant to fuzz test our software every year. And then they give me the report. And I'm like, guys? We're Intel security. Aren't we smart enough to do this ourselves? Why do I have to get one of these from a vendor and then tell you to run it? I mean, is it no money, no time, or you just don't know what you're doing? Okay, I'm, not, I'm being, I say that to them because I want them to act. But um, that's a pet peeve of mine is when someone else tells me I found these when we could have found them ourselves. Um, and we make sure that they get fixed. Um, there's manual code reviews. No matter how much you do with a tool, you cannot remove the human element. Um, I've had some people tell me the tool can, whatever the tool can find, the humans can find 10 times more. Okay, because the tool is only as smart as the human put rules in, but the humans can see the bigger picture and, and find things. So you cannot replace that. And in fact, in our SDL, if you could only have one thing, we would say you do human threat modeling on, on an architectural review. That's the most important thing you can do, is design it securely up front. The second most important thing, do static analysis. It's easy, it catches the low-hanging fruit. And then we work our way down the list. So again, these are the basics. Now, going to running, there's also the basics. And one rule I really don't appreciate, but I, I know it's true, is you can't outrun a bad diet. I have a lot of people come up to me and say, oh, you run ultras, that means you can eat anything. And I'm like, I wish. I really wish I could. Because if I eat anything, it, it sticks. And I was running a 5K up at Baylor University, um, up in McKinney, and the nurses were running with us, and they were saying, yeah, did you know that, that your health is 15% um, exercise and 85% diet? So I don't know how scientific that is, but it seems to make sense. Is You can, you can get healthy by... Um, Exercising a whole lot, but you're going to get a whole lot more by having a good, healthy diet. And it's the stuff we all know. Eat healthy, portion control, those kind of things. Uh, other basics. Get some sleep. 
Um, have a regular run schedule. Buy some good equipment. You know, you don't use the shoes they used 30 years ago. Um, like my manager used to be a trail runner. He goes, I had these tennis shoes and they hurt. Okay, now you can get really good shoes. Um, have an attitude of never giving up. With one exception, if you have an injury, don't run on an injury. Um, in, De in late December, I actually got some shin splints. I'd run uh, 10 marathons in 40 days, and most of them were on um, asphalt, and I got shin splints. And I really wanted to run three more marathons to get to the next level of crazy in Marathon Maniacs. But I was so close, but I had to stop. Because if you run on an injury, it doesn't have time to heal, and then you regret it. So for five weeks, I, I didn't run. I actually gained 10 pounds, <laughs> and I had to lose it again. But you have, I got healed, and I've been able to run again. So you gotta watch the injury part. Okay, going back to software security. I mentioned having an SDL. And if you go to Microsoft or any place, you'll see, um, or Cisco, there's, they have models everywhere. There's different things that you must do to develop secure software. And I already mentioned this. I guess I gotta look at the slides here. I already mentioned in the second column doing threat modeling and architectural reviews and whatnot. And static analysis, there's fuzz testing. These are a lot of different things. And we, I, we call this the, we actually call it internally the buffet model. Because it's like going to a buffet. Here's all the food out there, what are you gonna eat? Um, but it's really for the traditional waterfall development. And where I work, we've changed everything over to an agile environment. We're 90%, 95% agile now. And with agile, it's a different language, different altogether, but you basically put things in the um, backlog and you have them done during different sprints. And at the end of the day, you have something called the definition of done. And, and a definition of done says if you've done all these things, you're done, you can now potentially ship that increment. You can potentially send it to a customer if it's really done. And so we, we, we basically recommend which activities should be done early on or later on and get those into the different sprints so they happen throughout the cycle. Um, and I assume, does everyone know about Agile, what the concept is behind that? Okay, yeah. So, so getting that in there was um, an interesting chore, but that's something we do have um, in there. Okay, um, for running, there's what I call other tasks or proactive measures you should do. Um, you can get a heart rate monitor. And I used to monitor my heart rate quite a bit. I could try to see if I can get it above 179. Um, just because it would hover at 175 when I was running really hard. I think I hit it once or twice. But then I realized for me, I don't care about the heart rate. It's my breathing rate, the fourth one. So when I run, I run such that I can have a conversation with somebody next to me. Uh, and I just keep going. And so you pick, you pick which thing you're looking for. Um, but for muscle fatigue, you may, there's these bandage things you can put on that'll help stretch. Um, you can take a couple Advil before you do a run. Um, that way you don't feel the pain and it's more fun. And then people will be quick to tell you, yes, but it's a blood thinner, it could be harm, bad for you. Okay, pick your poison. A fun run with no pain or thin blood. Okay. There's always pain, trust me. Okay, and speaking of pain, um, with heart bleed, we actually had to do quite a few internal procedural changes when heart bleed um, came out. We created what was called a near crisis scenario policy. And for instance, our, our policy was, and it seemed to make sense at the time, but the policy was do not publish a security bulletin unless we can put something actionable in there for the customer, such as a workaround or a hot fix or a patch. Because if you just say, here's a vulnerability, sorry, we don't know what to do for you for now, you're just scaring people, you're letting the hackers know. Well, we hit the scenario with Heartbleed where you could run a simple tool and within a few minutes you could see any product was vulnerable or not. So you weren't, weren't saving them from anything, everyone's looking. And so we had to create a scenario where we would list all 100 or so products and we would sort them into different buckets. We would put them in the not vulnerable bucket or the vulnerable and not patched yet bucket or the vulnerable and patched, which is the one you wanted to be in if you were vulnerable. Um, 
We even created one called vulnerable but low risk. And we were very careful to describe that vulnerable but low risk means, yeah, if you run a scanner on it, you'll see that we have the vulnerable version of OpenSSL, but we have controls around that and the way it's called or implemented, it's, it's a minimal, it's not gonna hurt you, okay? We're not trying to sweep anything under the carpet, it's just, it just doesn't affect our product that heavily. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But the engineers will always patch them anyways because they get tired of scanner reports saying you're vulnerable, you're vulnerable, fix it. And it's easier to fix and to fight those off. And so those are the different product buckets. Um, customer communication, you know, what can you tell a customer when they, because they basically want to know, is my product vulnerable? That's all they care about. The little quick keyword search. I've had people say, you know, these bulletins are getting kind of long. I say, well, you know, I don't read dictionaries either, but if I want to know if product XYZ is vulnerable, I'll go there, do a quick search, I'll see it, I'll know right away. And so that seems to work. Um, one of the things we started doing and we keep doing is what's called a shared technology inventory. We have asked all the teams, all the development teams, which of your products use OpenSSL? Which use BIND? Which use the Network Time Protocol, NTP? Which use the Be Safe Crypto Library? Which use blah, 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 blah. We go down the list of third-party libraries, things that have bit us, and we get that information up front. So when another one comes in, we go, oh yeah, there's 12 of you guys who have products that are NTP. I'm gonna, we're gonna follow you guys even more closely because we wanna see if, if that's vulnerable or not. And we let everyone else know just in case something's changed because things are always changing. But having a shared technology inventory, it's as simple as a spreadsheet. It's listing the products and saying yes or no. And in our case, we add comments that say, well, this version is vulnerable, this one's not, or whatnot. Um, early notification expectations. Um, our customers are saying, you know what? In the case of a heart bleed, send us a text message just to say we are aware of it and we're on it. Okay, and, and we're, we should have a bulletin or something by the end of the day. And I call that stating the obvious, but customers want that reassurance that we know about it. It's funny, they'll call you like, did you guys know that there's this heart bleed? It's like, this is what we eat and breathe and live to do. I've heard this all morning. All, I'm sick of it, but it, they don't know that. So we got to let them know we're on it. And then we get a bulletin out um, as quick as we can with you know information, countermeasures, because they, they, they look to us as a trusted partner. And if we withhold information, then we, they, they lose that trust. Um, and there's other things, PCERT training process. I don't know if any of you have been in a situation like this, but even though we've had a, have a product security team, you get VPs or others that want to be heroes and they jump in and start saying, well, here's what we should do. No, here's what we should do. And they don't go through the right process. And it helps when you have an executive VP that basically says, guys, there's a team over there. Just work with them, crowd them in. Um, because if you don't, you've got a lot of different silos jumping around and it gets kind of crazy. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that's common in other scenarios. So learning from pain from running is, as I already mentioned, the Advil. Um, if you take a couple of those beforehand, the, you don't feel the pain till later. Um, I've learned that you can put bandages on so you don't have that problem with the shirt on the bottom left, the chafing. Um, and there's some anti-chafing things that, so if, you're, if your legs are rubbing together all the time and you put some anti-chafing on there, they won't be, you know, really raw. Again, I've learned the hard way on every one of these things at least once. <laughs> um, mustard. Anyone have any idea what you would use mustard for? Sandwiches. Yeah, what if you're hungry and you get a sub sandwich right in the middle of the race, someone hands it to you. Mustard has two things in it that help stop cramps. It has salt and it has vinegar. And you don't eat mustard because it tastes good, trust me. But if you're getting a leg cramp and you want to finish your race, if you can pop a mustard or two, within a minute the cramp will go away. Okay? That's all there is to it. There may be uh, some other expensive pills you can buy that are electrolytes or something, I don't know. I just go to McDonald's, grab a few mustards and run with them. And Sometimes I'll, I bring a few extras because I'll help other runners because I see them cramping up and you just say, here, have a mustard. And then I see them pass me a few minutes later. <laughs> it's all fun. It's all good. Other pain. I mentioned um, sunburns. I've learned on a beach marathon, you get burned on one side. I've learned if you wear a tank top and run the Irving Marathon like I did earlier this month, you get a really good sunburn. Okay? Because I don't... 
I don't like to put sunscreen on on my face because when I sweat, it gets in my eyes and it hurts. So I sometimes like, ah, oh, I don't need it. Okay, that's pain. Uh, mosquito repellent. I know that, it, that from 6 to 8 in the morning down in Brazos Bend, when I'm running a long trail run, the mosquitoes are big and they're hungry. And you're just swatting these things constantly. You see them on your arms, you're just hitting them. Yeah, I guess it occupies your time. You're not focused on anything else but killing the mosquitoes. But I'd rather be enjoying the trail, not killing these little mosquitoes. So you bring mosquito repellent. Um, I'll never run that one again without mosquito repellent. And then, of course, review the course. No, no, I just, I just ran a 50K in um, California Saturday, Saturday called the Diablo 50K Challenge. And it said, you know, you're going you're to climb up some hills. Well, Diablo Canyon, Diablo Mountain is 3,800 feet. And the race started at 100 feet. So we ran up to this mountain. And then we ran down and ran up the mountain nearby it. And we ran down, came up another mountain. It's like, guys, you can't find any more mountains. Came down. And then we came down. Instead of taking a nice, easy trail, we almost went straight down. Which is like, I've never run a straight down that I was afraid I would slip and fall and it hurt. I literally had to take little baby steps. I realized later, they didn't call it the Diablo trail run. They called it the Diablo challenge. So, you know, I should be reading these a little more carefully. Um, we finished that one, but it was probably the worst finish time ever. So, going back to software security, you may have a list of things to do, but that doesn't mean you're doing them well. There's always a way of doing something better. So, we have a product security maturity model that we put together where it starts from you know none, initial, basic, acceptable, mature. And you'll see these a lot. And from that, we identify 22 parameters that we would like to measure. And so we have documented all 22 parameters and what different things you need to do to be at what different levels. For instance, number 15, static analysis. If you're not doing it, you're basic. Or if you're using the you know, Lint or some stupid tool like that that's ancient. Um, if you've run the tool in the past quarter, okay, you're at the second level. If you run it frequently, maybe you're at the next level. If you not only run it frequently, but you are fixing the issues as you find them, that's even better. Um, we, we, have, we use the term, um, no new technical debt which is a nice way of saying, you don't have to go back and fix all the old stuff immediately, just don't let it grow. If you find new stuff, fix that at least, and then, then of course, go back and fix what you can, but don't let it grow. Um, and so though there are different levels. Uh, and based on these, we can put together a, I don't have it here, but we can, I put together a chart that shows each of the engineering organizations what their lowest score, highest score, and their average score is. And then you can, um, the teams can then look at that and say, gee, how come we're kind of on the low end? Whether because of a recent acquisition or are we just not taking it seriously? And then I can come in and say, oh, not only are you guys low, but you have the lion's share of the product vulnerabilities. Cause and effect, guys. Let's get to the, with the program. And so we're looking for those kinds of patterns where if you don't do product security up front, you're going to pay for it downhill, down, downstream. So when it comes to running, again, they're not all runs are the same. Some people run for distance. Some people run for speed. I'm a distance guy. And so normally you start with a 5K, and I put the miles in parentheses, and you work your way up. Um, and after 100 milers, they have these endurance runs. There's endurance runs here in Dallas um, where you can do 24, 48, or 72 hours. And basically you see how far you can run. It sounds like fun, right? <laughs> they do give you a big steak dinner at the end, so maybe that's motivational. So those are, those are just different goals. You've got to start somewhere and work your way up. Uh, when it comes to speed, if you look at marathons, in the U.S., most of the marathons say if you can't run and finish it in six hours, then don't sign up. Um, if you go to Germany, if you run it in f less than five hours, they're already taking the finish line down as you're trying to cross it. They're kind of like, you guys, just, you're way too slow. It's like no mercy. Um, about 25% of all runners can run a, a four-hour marathon. I've only done that once, and it was downhill. 
Um, if, if for my age, if I wanted to qualify for Boston, I'd have to run a 330. So I don't know if I'll ever get there. If you look at the fastest marathon, the glass ceiling, it was just above two hours, 203. And if you look at the fastest 100 miler, it was a record was broken just in 2013, a 20 year old record, and it was about a half a minute under 12 hours. Okay, so this guy finished finished his 100 miler t over twice as fast as most people. Okay, just crazy stuff. If you run a, a 100 miler in under 24 hours, they give you a sub 24 hour belt buckle that's cooler than the regular one that says, oh, I finished it in 30 hours. So if that matters, sub 24 or better. So those are different metrics. You can see how fast or how far or, you know, what are your goals? Um, I have a brother who, who runs really fast. He worked for Microsoft and he, he's just a speed runner. Um, he thinks I'm crazy for a distance. I think he's crazy because he never has fun. He's pushing so hard. Okay, so you, you pick, your, pick your goal. Then, of course, you need metrics. And metrics are needed to determine, basically, the only, there's only one good reason in my mind to have a metric, and that is to drive positive change. If you don't have a, if you're not going to drive positive change, don't waste your time on it. So here's a metric that I, I dummy down, where we like to use heat maps, whether it's for incident response or whether it's for how many teams are doing security reviews and how often, and we'll list them by business unit and then by product. And so I, I can see the fourth column looks like it has a lot of red. They're not reporting security reviews to our team. And then I can look at their, their number of incidences or vulnerabilities, and they're pretty high. And I can go back to them and say, we're seeing a correlation here. Um, you're not paying it up front, and you're paying for it downstream. You know, how do you like fire stomping? Is it working out for you? And so we can use these to motivate that change. Um, I had one metric I put together on which of the products had a product security champion assigned to it. And every one of the business units except for one had PSCs assigned. One of them just had a couple of them. We sent that to the executive staff. They discussed it in their executive staff meeting. Two weeks later, all the teams were fully staffed. Okay, it was one of those few metrics that really worked. Okay, because no one wanted to be, everyone's out of step but Johnny. Okay, so you don't want to shame them, but you just want to show them facts and say, guys, it's important. Let's get with the program. Um, I do the same with spreadsheets on marathons. I like to track, you can track speed so you see, see how fast you go. So that's just kind of fun. And in both running and in software security development, there's always a better way. You know, find it. And I say this because I just came back from RSA. There's thousands of vendors trying to sell us their software. Some of them have old ideas. I'm like, really? I was doing that 15 years ago. While others have really innovative ideas. They're usually the smaller ones on the very outskirts, not the big vendor names in the middle. So we, we cruise the outskirts and just to see if there's any great ideas from these mom and pop shops. And you find some really good ones. And those are the types of things you look for because they're innovative and they can, can take you to the next level. And of course, all this pain and effort, there should be a reward. Um, these are probably obvious, but when you have secure code, there's less fire stomping. Um, when you have secure code, you have higher customer satisfaction. And your hope is that will lead to increased business, which is what everyone wants. You got to protect the brand. Um, how would you like, you, know, you would never want that brand to be associated like, I, I still love Target, but when people in this room think Target, aha, you got hacked. Okay. Or TJ Maxx, you know, you're the first to get hacked. Okay, I don't want people to say, pick my company and say, oh yeah, you guys have got the big breach. You know, strike three on the first strike, you know. So we, we want to protect that brand. And of course, it also helps meet compliance requirements. And when it comes to running, sometimes your goals are not very sound. Um, I signed up for a single marathon because I heard it had the biggest medal in the world. It was in Kingwood, Texas. And I ran it, I got a breastplate. Couldn't wear it. But I needed some excuse, and I'm showing it. I'm showing what it looks like to the Dallas one on the right, um, the half marathon. So you know that's kind of frivolous but fun. Um, my dog ran it with me. And they didn't want to break my dog's neck, so they gave my dog a smaller half half marathon medal that wasn't quite as dangerous. So 
I only put this one in here because when I finished my first 100 miler last September, somebody took a picture in the upper left. And that is how I truly felt after running 100 miles. Kind of like looking at you like, like, don't talk to me. Okay, then I put on a fun smile after I recovered a little bit. Um, and then I went and ran one in Brazos Bend um, two, a couple months later and knocked three hours off my time. Um, and there were live alligators. I took that picture. He was on the trail, kind of staring at us. Um, but we were faster than him, so it was okay. So I list these to show that um, you, there's always improvement. You can always you know, increase the time and set different goals because the, the second one's a whole lot easier than the first one because you've already learned you know, take no dose at three in the morning or you'll fall asleep while you're running at night. Yes, it's possible. So to wind up, the big question I asked early on was which is easier, developing secure software or running a 100 mile ultra marathon? And the consensus is, well, the real answer, yes. Number one, Yes. So the impact is much broader in developing secure software. For everyone has their own reasons, yes. That's why I picked that one. My reasoning is they're both extremely painful, but technically when you finish a hundred miler, you're done. You're never done with secure software because there's always something else, a new their heart bleed coming around the bend, and it'll keep giving. But as soon as I put a box around this and said, you're done, then I go up and sign up for another 100 miler. So, you know, there's crazy things you do. So figure that one out. Yes? The reason I chose one was that the 100 miler could kill you. I don't think it's <laughs> Again, if you don't build up to it, yes. So more people die from half marathons than from the other ones. But so, okay. Well, again, the, thank you for letting me discuss my two passions. Um, any questions on any of these things? Yes. Not really. Um, I we are a member of the BSIM, and we did a full BSIM audit that I was involved with, and. Um, we know right where we are in BSIM. The one we created was to match our SDL and how we develop software. And we can even map a lot of it to the BSIM. Um, certain things we do, for instance, um, when, we get a, 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 when we get an incident, we always, there's always a CVE to map it to, a common vulnerability number. And you can map those to CWEs, or common weakness enumeration. And the weakness is the problem, the CVEs are the symptoms of the problem. And so we um, map our CWEs and we look for those patterns. And like the, the top three that I was mining out last week is unquoted um, path. So like in the registry or whatnot, if you don't quote a path that has, has a space in it, then the path comes out wrong and, and it ends at that space and not the whole path. And hackers have a way of taking advantage of that. Uh, another one is, is having unsalted hash. Okay, we had two vulnerabilities based on that. It's like, come on guys, that was LinkedIn's issue two years ago. You know, the basics, um, things like that. Um, and so we look for those things and make it very specific training with our groups. Because when you have this many engineers, you've got some groups that are just top notch. Have you other groups that we just acquired or something and they're, they're struggling and they're a different end of the scale and you gotta work with both of them. And we meet as a group, we do mentoring, um, we have technical roundtable meetings every other week, and we bring up issues and discuss them so we can all grow from it. Um, so that's just the pattern. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay. So the question, if I could predict a vulnerability or if I could, as in how many vulnerabilities? If I could predict how many, well, 
if I were to predict how many, I'd have to go historical and look back, because um, that's what I've got. And I can historically look back at any of our products and say, you know, this product here is on the front lines, or this one here is a network-based product. You're always getting beat up. Okay, so I can I can I can tell you which products are going to get beat up next. Um, it's easy. Um, fixing them is sometimes harder, because say there there's some teams that are just top of the game and some that we're, we're building up and they're mentoring them. Um, and, you know, Payne's a good teacher. <laughs> They'll figure it out. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>